talk about transportation. It's relevant. It's something I've been working a lot about. And this is, this is also the kind of uh, thing that confronts us every day when we have designs that, that either had too narrow an intention or, or some kind of a, a set of assumptions that may not be serving our communities well anymore. I think um, many of you uh, recognize this scene. This is the, at the turn of the last century. And what's kind of interesting about it is that there's not a car in sight, right? Uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, 1900, 1903, the Ford Motor Company was born. 1908 was the first Model T. Um, this was a, a clearly remarkable technology. Um, and this is, you know, a decade later, 1913. Um, there's not a horse in sight in this picture. Um, there, this was a time without the internet. There was no rapid dissemination. Um, and, you know, this was a thing that, that, that people were mesmerized by, this technology. Um, and clearly, uh, some of the elements of, of that early system design uh, were immediately evident and successful. Uh, for example, it solved a problem that, that every single city in the world was facing, horse poop, right? It got rid of the horse poop problem instantly. It was amazing. And, uh, and, and people were just thrilled with it. But uh, that's not the only thing it did, right? Um, the, the biggest thing was how much every city, every place in America began to prioritize the automobile and its circulation, um, you know, kind of above everything else. Um, in the modern American city today, we devote somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the entire land to the storage and circulation of automobiles. There are between six and nine permanent parking spaces for each and every vehicle in America. Uh, it's a lot of land. We've permanently divided and depressed property values and limited access uh, by bisecting neighborhoods by highways. We've entirely concealed and undermined the benefits of proximity um, and convenient daily destinations within walking distance. You know, we don't, you know, so much of our cities have been designed without any thought that people would ever get there by any means other than an automobile. We subsidize the wealthier car owning households with free or low cost parking uh, and use to the public space for car storage, but we don't have an equivalent program for people who aren't traveling by, by, by car. You know, I always wanted to take, a, a, you know, a six by nine foot uh, raised bed garden on wheels that I would put in the parking space on the street. You know, I'd move it, you know, when it was street cleaning. But why can't I have the use of that space? I'll pay my $35 a year for the rental of that space. But that's not open to people, right? So it's, it's, it's not fair. Um, it has also made... Um, car ownership, an absolute uh, necessity. It subordinates people to vehicles, um, and it has created environments, which I know you experience every day, where something is nearby, but you just can't get to it safely, right? Because the automobile traffic is so heinous, it's so, it's so extreme. Um, but the, the more important thing, and I mentioned this earlier, that the American dream is alive and well in Canada, uh, not in America. Part of it is we've really made auto ownership, you know, the prerequisite for entering the U.S. economy. You can't get a job or keep a job in a lot of places if you don't have a car. And it's not cheap to have a car. Um, it's, the, it's the only way to access most of the big job centers in almost every part of the country. And it ensures that parents become chauffeurs as a primary responsibility when they have school-aged children. Transportation spending, the second highest cost, um, it's, 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 um, it's intense, right? Uh, we also sicken and kill millions of people every year. Uh, about 40,000 people died last year alone directly from collisions. 1.2 million people worldwide. About 20 times as many get injured. And more than 200,000 people die annually in our country from diseases associated with a sedentary lifestyle. And many more are sickened by tailpipe emissions and particulates. 
So it's, I don't even want to get into what happens, you know, what we've done in pursuit of securing fuel in foreign conflicts and entanglements so that we make sure we continue to have access uh, to, to petroleum. And we have created um, a, a problem where in our modern transportation system, we absolutely reward um, failure. If you utterly fail to coordinate transportation and land use and you result in huge congestion problems, it is so easy to get a grant from the federal government to add more roads. If you actually were successful and coordinated transportation and land use so you didn't have all this traffic, you know, there's, there's not a reward. You either get no money or you get, uh, you know, you, you're, you're kind of ignored. So cars demand bigger and wider and more roads. Um, electrifying uh, Hummers and F-150s, um, carrying those new vehicles, they violate the standards, uh, the weight standards for, uh, for most highways. Um, you couldn't have a, uh, a truck that carried those because they're so heavy. Um, and, and they're so large that a lot of them couldn't see, uh, you know, a bicyclist. Uh, a whole classroom full of children in front of those vehicles, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge safety issue. And finally, we fomented a global crisis when it comes to climate, right? So, so this was certainly not the intention of either the maker of automobiles or, right, the, the cities that rushed to accommodate them. But this is what we got, as sure as if it was our design assignment. We've done this so thoroughly and so well. Um, so I think it's really important, you know, to note the moment that we're in right now. Because of a combination of factors, including a response to the climate crisis and the recession, we have about $3 trillion in federal funding flowing to cities. In California, you're e even better positioned because you are, you are the, the, the best state in the country when it comes to addressing climate and putting your money where your mouth is. So there's more money and more requirements that really have to do with decarbonizing transportation. But we can't do it the way we did it before. Not in any way the way we did it before. We have to be really deliberate about our intentions. We have to be really specific. Um, we talked about the work that we do in our cities, uh, a lot of us uh, who were planning directors undoing you know, the work of the past generations, reconnecting streets, right? Uh, getting rid of one-way streets, bringing people back to live, you know, in the center of the city. Well, the problem, the, these other problems that we have to undo, particularly when it comes to inequality um, and climate, right? That is, is a much more difficult and serious task. So when we talk about intention, um, we have to spell it out. All of us right now in our neighborhoods, in our cities, we should be saying, this is what we intend any infrastructure spending to be doing in our city today. You know, we intend for it to meet uh, a much broader set of ob objectives. Uh, this is from the city of Pittsburgh. Um, we were working with them last year on a series of initiatives uh, around bringing new mobility options to Pittsburgh. And these are the, this is the design remit for their program, right? Safety, access, affordability. How about this? Good health and joy. You know, have travel be fun instead of frustrating. And, uh, and, and have it build an enhanced community. So this is not gonna be the design remit in every neighborhood. This is something you have to figure out for yourself. But what I'm saying is, it's, uh, it, it's, you're, it's not too soon to be thinking about this right now. Money is coming to the city of San Diego. Money is coming to the region. There's gonna be five years worth of dollars. Now is the time for people to be saying, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, this is what we want. These are the kind of connections we wanna make. Um, as, as several speakers, including Gil said, let's revalue proximity. You know, let's really focus on short trips. Short trips are mostly a land use, right? So, so that means putting some more convenient destinations near uh, residential neighborhoods. That would enable a lot of trips to be taken that way. Um, it also means um, recognizing that we already take, mo even in San Diego, even in Los Angeles, most of our trips are short trips. 
right? More than, more than half of our trips are less than three miles. An e-bike would do that in a second, a conventional bike also, if you didn't feel like you were taking your life in your hands, right? Every time you, and, and we don't have incomplete networks for cars. How do we think it's acceptable to have four blocks, a bike lane, and then nothing, right? That's ridiculous. So, so these are the kinds of things we should be using the money to repair. We should be trying to capture those short trips and, and, and recognize that, uh, that, that transit is, is a huge part of the solution also. So I'm gonna just leave you with that and uh, thank you. What I'm going to talk about is sort of my background experience, but bring some of the, a lot of the conversation from today into some real stories around three cities, how these uh, issues have played out in my practice, and specifically in uh, San Francisco, Chicago, and Boulder, Colorado, very distinctively different cities. And uh, talk about sort of, give you sort of short little stories about each of the areas, how design discourse plays out in these areas, primarily because one, because of the DNA of the city from the uh, uh, planning context, the urban form, and the governance uh, of each city determines you know, how you talk about design uh, and planning in each city. Second, how we engage with community, how we talk about um, those issues um, or the challenges of design, how we engage with them, literally makes impact on how, what the outcomes are at the end, and I'll give sort of examples of that. And then third, uh, how the most contentious issues and debates about design, density, height, uh, are exactly the same, uh, regardless of the city scale. I know this talk is about big cities, and I'm a fan of big cities, but from my experience, those specific issues are exactly the same, whether you're a 50,000 uh, people city or uh, uh, a two million um, population city. So let me start quickly first with uh, San Francisco. You know, San Francisco is one of the most beautiful cities. It's an imageable city. You, ha you can have an image when you think of San Francisco. Why? It's not by accident. It's, you know, yeah, the topography and the urban form is wonderful, but it's also, it's urban design and planning that really created that form and shape and, and texture that people will die <laughs> if you try to propose to change anything about that. But that happened, you know, in 18, started in 1839. So that context, that DNA about the uh, San Francisco has an important role in terms of how people talk about height, talk about density, talk about change, today, but it's also its political context. It's the most engaged city around planning issues, development issues, or any change issues. So everybody comes out uh, to talk about that, and they engage ad nauseum if you have any proposed changes. So San Francisco, how did it come about? So it, in 1839, Jean-Jacques uh, Vioget sort of laid out 10 blocks in the downtown area called the Vara blocks. The Vara is most, some of you know, it's like a Spanish measuring system, a long chain, two men on horses on each end will take the chain of one vara is about 33 inches. And at that time, the longest chain that they had was 100 varas. So the shorter side, they said, okay, 100 vara, it translates to 275. And the longer side, they went in 100, and then they went halfway, and they said, okay, those are the blocks. They laid out the first 10 blocks, and that sort of created the DNA of San Francisco in terms of its urban form. And those are really wonderful. They actually work, you know, you can divide them into 16, 25 foot um, lots on one side, 16.47, and on both sides, and the street is about 68 feet. That sort of translated the rest of the pattern of San Francisco and that people love about it. It's walkable, it's uh, human scale in, from that perspective. And that image that you saw before translated that way. And then the pattern, you know, when uh, that's, uh, uh, this is uh, Market Street, uh, for, I forgot the date, but later the developers complained that these are two small blocks, uh, they're not good, you know, conducive for industrial uh, development, so uh, O'Farrell came and pretty much doubled the size of the north of Market uh, Vara blocks and just doubled it down in the uh, south of Market to create you know, spaces that are conducive to development. 
So that sort of informed the pattern uh, of uh, San Francisco. So today, and, and then fast forward, the redevelopment area in the 40s and 50s, the highway uh, construction. This is a diagram I love from the former redevelopment agency of uh, uh, San Francisco. Progress in city planning. So a lot of those fine-grained Victorian uh, uh, pattern were considered as uh, a blight. That diagram in the bottom, so all the dark, you know, uh, the beautiful uh, places that we think of in San Francisco. At that time, it was modernism. Uh, that was old. Uh, it was blight. And this is from the redevelopment agency. And progress were those uh, concrete blocks, object buildings sitting in space. This is a time of Corbusier and all the uh, uh, big sort of modernist movement that are taking place in the 40s and 50s. That was progress from, and, and now you realize, you know, why people have a sort of a jaded view of redevelopment agencies. Never mind that when I was there in uh, uh, 90s and early 2000s, uh, 2000s, the new redevelopment agency was actually fantastic. They were doing a lot of great work in the city. So when I was uh, uh, working in San Francisco in a uh, long time ago, in the early 90s, uh, this is what Trans Bay looked like, the Trans Bay Terminal. So south of Market, the, right after the Loma Prieta earthquake, there was a you know, great opportunity in that hole that you see uh, for redevelopment of that area and bringing high-speed rail, uh, reconfiguring Trans Bay Terminal, and the uh, conversation about design and planning started at that time. At that time, there was a different kind of conversation. San Francisco did not have any uh, uh, culture of housing in the downtown area. Every, you know, uh, the Castro or Haight-Ashbury Mission District are vibrant with lots of residential and um, other commercial ac activities, but this was dead at night. Uh, in the evening. So this was a great opportunity to make a big transformation uh, for uh, San Francisco. And this come again once in, a, in a, a generation to have that major transformation. So the conversation at that time is how should that area be uh, uh, developed? So the state gave the uh, city most of the land around uh, Trans Bay area. And at that time, we were working in the context of the urban design guidelines and, and, and regulations for buildings. You've heard of the wedding cake, uh, you know, copied New York to actually implement that in San Francisco. And at that time, it didn't allow for residential towers because it's too expensive to step residential towers. So developers would not build for residential in the downtown area. So that was one of the constraints. And the other part of it is, it actually did not result, in most cases, great architecture. So you have these bulky buildings, fat, they meet the standards, they meet the regulations, uh, and it was blah in terms of you know, architecture and form. And there was also a height limit, 550 feet uh, height limit. And that was a reaction to a lot of the 50s uh, development. Stop them from burying our city under a skyline of tombstones. Uh, this is debates that started there uh, because of buildings like the Fontana Towers that are right by the water, built this bulky, fat buildings, blocking views, and that was a reaction. And it was also a reaction to the Transamerica building. <laughs> At that time, it was seen as a monstrosity. It was actually designed for 1,500 feet when it was thought about initially. 1,500, remember that number. Uh, but they reacted negatively and they put the 550 foot height limit in reaction to that uh, and a lot of the buildings that are coming up. So there was a big um, challenge to how you develop that prime property um, to actually meet the time of the day. And we talked about this today uh, around you know, some of the aversion to height is that kind of uh, context. Uh, this is a diagram from Alan Jacobs, Jake's diagram. Uh, he was a former planning director in San Francisco, a very, you know, giant of a, an urban planner, and um, you know, he wrote uh, Great Streets, one of the seminal books about Great Streets. That's kind of his diagram to describe what th that looked like. So the discourse about planning and design started with incredible uh, commun community engagement. So San Franciscans engage at, you know, ad nauseum anything about planning issues. 
That was the time when I still had hair and we had a significant amount of engagement, but the engagement process was about how do we sort of separate these complex issues and peel into sort of the idea of how transformation takes place. In this case, you start with 2D planning. We call them the planning game. Oh, here's colors. They represent different scale, different square footage. Let's just focus what you know, the area could yield. There was discussion about actually capturing value in the uh, site that are going to be developed to actually build uh, the Transbay terminal. There was an, a projection about $1.6 billion was the estimated cost of the terminal uh, at that time. And the uh, objective was to capture value from the increased height eventually. But we didn't get into height at this time. We just wanted to have agreement and color card planning game to determine the pattern. And then we took that to the next level and we said, okay, there will be three potential options. These are kind of scenarios. Again, very simple, an eight-year-old can understand it. Diagrams, we have the blocks, you know, the available blocks here. And we did initially three uh, options. Um, you, here's the new the, uh, Salesforce tower now, but we did not talk about height at that time sort of increasing. We said uh, 550 would be the highest. Let's really talk, talk about form and scenarios. How do we place towers in these areas to actually uh, have you know, light and air on the streets? What is the form? Mostly around uh, thinking about the urban form. So each of the diagrams show, uh, we called it the checkerboard pattern, you know, two towers per block with 150 foot separation what you see in pink is sort of the datum, the ground floor. We'd always have about 65 to 75 foot height, and then you go to two towers. What does that mean from urban form? But also, I won't go into it, so each of those calculations, whether you have one tower or two towers, uh, also has numbers around what, how much uh, revenue it would yield. So this area was going to become, and it became, uh, Melarus district, a taxing district that you capture the value. So when you go to one tower, from two tower to one tower, you have 50% you know, of the potential revenue. But community groups have to consider all of those, not just form. But I'm just gonna talk about form. So the height is also you know, illustrated. You go high in the middle and then you step down as you get closer to the water. That's kind of a San Francisco pattern. And then illustrate that what it means from many different neighborhoods and views. The checkerboard pattern, one tower per block, and one downtown hill. And we have debates and ratings, so what does that mean from a skyline perspective? What does it mean to look at that from the uh, bridge uh, as well? So then we started thinking uh, next level. So height is a problem. Uh, 550 feet was not going to do it. It's not appropriate everywhere, but in that area to capture the value and one of the most important and expensive part of the land, you need to capture value vertically, but how do you do it? First, you have to change the paradigm around height. And we used, you know, some, this is simple Photoshop cut and paste, right? There's nothing high technology. We said, okay, we take community groups and uh, meetings. We say, well, Fontana Towers, what do you hate about them? Oh, it blocks the views. You know, you can't see the water. Say, why do you, well, how about you cut half of it and put it on top? It's exactly the same square footage. And you say, uh, this or this, this or this. I don't know, eight or nine out of times, they go, ah, I would rather have this because I have more lights and air and opening and views. Again, an eight-year-old can understand this. This is not a complex discussion. Some of the buildings that were going up at that time, Fontana Tower, and uh, um, Avalon Towers, I think this is on, is it second? Uh, John is not here. I believe it's on um, second street. So we take that and do the same thing. Simple <laughs> Photoshop. And you won't believe how much actually people's ideas about what height means uh, 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 changes. Along with this, I don't have those diagrams, but we also talk about, you know, how do you experience uh, buildings? You know, the first 60 degrees, and people talk about that today. It's like the ground floor, that really matters. And so from that, again, using uh, Alan Jacobs' diagram, so maybe in the downtown area, this is not appropriate everywhere. We might want to go skinnier and taller instead of short, short and fat. 
you know, it has a lot of environmental implications. And then that led to more acceptance of height. And that led us to actually change the regulations, the wedding cake that, that was sort of there since the 70s, to actually have a base, a podium that has, you know, no bulk control, and then you limit the tower's um, size, the spacing, and that then became written into the regulations that then helped kind of uh, shape. Well, this is a Skidmore, I believe, from the Transway development. These are the early kind of ideas, uh, forms, before anything was built. And now, you know, some of the diagrams from the crude diagrams and translating into what is now built, well, the Salesforce Tower is now about 1,000 feet, is it? It, the first time I actually proposed 750, people freaked out. Redevelopment agencies say, don't even talk about that. We cannot go there at this time. That's when the sketches and illustrations, which you don't even see, I use techniques. Whenever you use lime green people are, and free sketches, they respond better than, <laughs> than those uh, 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 computer drawings. So that's San Francisco. Chicago has a completely different DNA. Uh, although it has you know, a great plan. Burnham's 1906 plan was kind of the most uh, important plan at the time and even today. It was the first uh, modern time plan for any major uh, US city at that time. But that laid out you know, literally for the next 100 to 200 years the DNA of uh, Chicago. Uh, protected waterfront, public spaces, they uh, adapted kind of the Beaux-Arts plan, the French plan and boulevards and streets in the public realm is just as important as, as the blocks or development blocks. And this was done by you know, the civic, um, uh, and not government, but the civic uh, and businesses of, of Chicago, where there's a great culture of that in Chicago for uh, how the city is developed. And that resulted in the form and the uh, skyline and the water, uh, waterfronts that's completely protected and accessible for 26 miles because of the 1909, um, 1906 uh, uh, Burnham Plan. 1909, I'm sorry. And then Chicago's DNA is also built on some of the greatest architects uh, of the 20th century uh, actually practiced there. Right after the fire, it was Tabla Rasa, and that's where uh, a lot of the uh, Chicago's architectural culture came about. Fast forward, uh, when I worked there in the 2000s, Mayor Richard M. Daley was the mayor, and this is where, again, uh, he was the chief architect, the chief urban planner of the city. He loved city planning, not from a planning perspective where it takes 20 years, but city planning today and then building it tomorrow. So he had no patience for waiting. So temporary buildings, he called it pilots. Oh, if he doesn't work, let's make them pilots, and then we build something, or pilot green roofs, and then they become, uh, they become uh, regulations in the city. So when I was there, we were doing a major transformation for the downtown, the central area plan, and sort of projecting the growth of the city. And, you know, Millennium Park story, when that was built, that was a major transformation for the city, the public realm, first kind of actually leading the way of the transformation of the city of Chicago at that time. Because of that, there was significant interest on, on the private properties around because that added significant value to, to, to that, uh, that neighborhood. Um, and when I started with the city, I mean, this is a short story. Uh, first week, the commissioner asked me to come to this meeting, a presentation by the developer of all of this area. A guy, um, uh, they developed all of this uh, buildings as sort of new Chicago neighborhood. The mayor, Mayor Daly, moved in one of those buildings that they built. And these two kind of short and fat buildings that you see there, they built those. I didn't know, so I walked into the meeting and they unveiled this a year of planning and design that this developer has developed to the commissioner. And I, liked, I was very diplomatic. When I looked at it, they had proposed right at that corner which is like the bookend of uh, Grand Park, uh, a stubby building like this, but very fat. 
And after they presented, the commissioner, uh, Alicia Berg at that time, asked me, so well, any comments? She introduced me, this is a new chief urban, uh, deputy commissioner for chief urban planner, designer for the city. And I was diplomatic, I said, you know, I've been coming to Chicago on and off from San Francisco, and I was just really disappointed about what the lost opportunity there was along Lakeshore Drive. And I mentioned these two buildings. And, and I see kind of the architects and the developer going, the hell is he talking about? Why I mean, those buildings are uh, really important buildings. They sold right away and they are wonderful. What is the concern? I said, oh, no, I don't have any concerns about it. Obviously, I'll buy there as well if I have the view of the lake. But I said, Chicago invented the modern time architecture. They invented the tall building. This is a great opportunity to book and, and complete Grand Park. And they're looking at me, and, uh, he, he, and then he said, i never forget, I spent about $1.6 billion of development in the downtown. These are successful projects, and one. And then two, he said, we can't go above 400 feet because the Michigan Avenue is a landmarked uh, area, but not all the way here. What you see back there, they have about 400 foot datum. I said, the issue is not about height so much, but it is important here because it's the right place to complete the, the Grand Park, but it's also an important place that then you save space to create public spaces on the ground floor. Why not go taller? This is where a tall building should be. And they freaked out. She said, we're, normally we're sort of, we come here and they tell us to make it shorter. And I said, it's because the design maybe did not work. It's because the ground floor, floor may not have worked. And they looked at the commissioner and I said, oh, you have to go back to the drawing board. This is the thing about Chicago too. There's no like, sort of planning commission. Yeah, they have final say often that everything is negotiated. There's a deals task force in the planning department. So, and there's a team, the commissioner and the urban designer and the planners get together and any development and you, you go through it and so you have a negotiation. The floor area issue allows you to build you know, significantly high, but through negotiation is that you determine what the height and the building uh, character is going to be. So they went back and came back with new designs. They went to pub the public, the community groups, and they were surprised that the response they got was really, really positive. Because they did a building, you know, they, ha they have like four sites here. So they started building, you know, proposed the 680 feet at that time to be literally the, the bookend of, of the Grand Park. And after the uh, design started, he sent me a letter, the developer. Normally we are sort of skeptical about city, urban uh, city government planners, but I have to tell you this building has become the highest selling property in, uh, in, the, in the country for a condo at the time before it was even built. So they were incredibly surprised. This is where private and public sector, in terms of if you have good leadership within the city, you can actually work, uh, work with them. That then led to significant amount of transformation at the bookend, um, where, uh, and, you know, and this is the other thing. So I used San Francisco in Chicago, and I'll bring some of those diagrams, and I say, hey, this is what we did in San Francisco. And when you do that, and this is a lesson for, I think, for the San Diego folks who are planning to implement. When you bring other cities' ideas, people actually open up. It's the easy trick to do. So I use that in Chicago to tell them, hey, this is what is going on in San Francisco, because I went to Chicago after that. So that then translated, you know, the design, because of the design culture in Chicago, you have some of the greatest architects. Once you give them the form, the outcome and the uh, products are actually much better. It's not about the height, it's really uh, some of the quality and design which we control less about it. Uh, and it's really up to the culture of the city that requires you know, good design. Now a completely different scale. <laughs> From the city of Chicago, I went to Boulder, Colorado. It's one of a spectacular city. It's kind of like uh, San Francisco in a way, but a completely different scale. What's unique about Boulder is uh, in the 50s or 40s, uh, two professors from uh, UC, uh, CU uh, Boulder, actually activists, they're physics and I think, uh, uh, I forgot the other guy, 
they decided that there should be an urban growth boundary. And at a certain height in the mountain, they said they marked the area and they said above this line, no city services will be provided. So it will grow um, uh, sustainably. So then what you see in green, that whole of area, that whole area is the city of uh, uh, Boulder. But the urban growth boundary sort of protected that area and the city over the years and to this day, they tax themselves to buy the land to protect it as open space. You have to have a compelling reason to grow into those areas if you really run out of space in the center. But one of the, ch and, and like San Francisco in uh, Boulder, uh, zoning, you, know, you can solve everything about planning. So they talk about zoning ad nauseum. At city council, they would quote Vitruvius and Shakespeare when they talked about a, a three foot height variance uh, request, literally. They would bring Vitruvius and they would talk about, you know, what the meaning of that three foot design would mean for this, the uh, uh, city of uh, Boulder. But what was interesting was uh, uh, there was a major opportunity to transform what is called the civic area in, in Boulder. So north of Canyon is the downtown. It had gone through some, uh, the famous Pearl Mall is right about here. And there were some new developments that are taking place here. This is around uh, 2011, 2012. And there was a huge reaction from the community because the buildings that were built in the downtown were called um, a sort of Manhattanization of the Canyon Boulevard because they were built to the height limit of 55 feet. <laughs> Not 550, 55 feet. But if you heard the debate, it was exactly the same as San Francisco. There is 500 feet. This, anything above even 55 foot is going to destroy their quality of life forever. And it's a well-educated, well, -educated, well you know, people who talk about Vitruvius would talk about uh, anything. So they hated the 55 foot building that were new ones. So there was a whole debate going on. The first week I joined, I went before the, uh, 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 Planning Commission, I'm sorry, the City Council had directed the planning department to come back because there was, uh, sorry, I forgot, a uh, little context here. There was a plan to actually expand south of Canyon uh, of the downtown and there was a big resistance because they did not like what was being built right along Canyon. And because there are three buildings uh, on the end, the Atrium building, the square building, uh, Dushanbe Tea House from Tajikistan is the building that was brought in as a sister city and then put, put there, and a band shell from the 1930s, uh, which was sort of a hangout for homeless people. Because we proposed a boulevard, and they would die over the, the band shell being uh, even relocated because it's historic. Historic preservation there is, uh, <laughs> it, um, we'll talk about it another time. So, <laughs> so They've directed planning department to come back with three options uh, of uh, the South of Canyon development. But the, everything they talked about is FAR. So the direction was, the current FAR was like 1.2 floor area ratio, or 2.2 that was allowed. So they asked them to come up with what a 2.0 FAR, a 2.2, or a 2.7 could look like so that they can decide on the zoning. It completely backfired because they looked at this and they said, there's no difference. I mean, there's, this is, and, and you could hear in the, at 1, 1 a.m. in the morning meetings at city council, literally debating this. So when I came and I, you know, they said, okay, come back because there was a new vision was being discussed about FAR. They said, come back again. So I came back, actually, that's when I joined and said, you know, you're, ha you're having the wrong conversation here. If your direction is to come up with a new vision for South of Canyon, why are you, you know, focusing on the building area? You own, you own about 75% of the land in that civic area. Why not transform the public realm, not the building blocks, but the space in between? Uh, that would transform, that's a new vision. And I said, by the way, Look at what Chicago did in Millennium Park. 
and I brought Millennium Park images and fit it on, um, on the plan. It's exactly the same size. This is 27 acres from here to that end, and that's what Millennium Park is. What is the Millennium Park of Boulder? And they went, huh, that's interesting. So, and then, you know, looked at, you know, the boulevard opportunity for Canyon. They have the Boulder Creek. Why not we focus on the, uh, the major streets? Boulevard, you know, tree planting, and turn that, you know, derelict streets and more pedestrian friendly with more uh, like Paris and lime green colored sketches of the different parts of the areas, people have a softer response to that. <laughs> and uh, you know, how you can create boulevard with you know, bikes and pedestrians and uh, you know, everything else, how small uh, scale areas could be created, alleys. So that really changed the conversation. At the end of the, this process, the very extreme, including Steve Pomerantz, <laughs> Bill knows him, and Plan Boulder is a one extreme sort of NIMBY organization to the developers. Both of them actually applauded when city council said, okay, let's go in this direction. And that then turned into, you know, how do we get public engagement? And one thing that we did there, because Boulder is really smart, we said, we planners should not go out and actually speak in, in the public engagement. Let's give them the tools. Let's hire a an artist to talk about planning and engagement. And this is a short video, and we hired this uh, uh, performance artist to come and uh, actually talk about what the place could be so that we get people who don't normally come to public meetings in about planning to come out. And she did, uh, she, she learned about, she didn't know anything about planning. We told her what we wanted, the outcome. And this is kind of a short couple of minutes video. Just watch it. Protocol number two deals with my anxiety about uh, change. Sometimes I'm thinking change is not a good idea. And I think, Ugh, I like Boulder the way it is. I don't want it to change. But I think, no, step back. Think about uh, the atemporality of the human experience, of the experience of the planet. When you step far enough back, look at geological time, you see that change is inevitable. And so in order to feel the sense of history and time, I took myself using um, applied science and modern technology and inserted photos of myself, videos of myself into the past, into the Precambrian era, into the Mesozoic era, into the 1890s, into the 1920s, um, the 1970s, and the 1950s. That practice of taking my contemporary self into the past really soothed my anxiety, but it felt also important to bring the um, past into the present. And that's why with the use of um, this little Victoria number and also the use of um, my worm outfit um, that would have of course come from the Precambrian area, I was able to imagine what that prehistoric reality was and how important it is to our, our present day. In addition, it felt important to imagine what the future would be, to bring the past, the present into the future. And so you see me here in the worm and the Victorian outfit and the contemporary outfit and some possible futures. Um, futures, you know, I don't know if it's going to look like the Matrix or Star Wars. I don't know if that's right, the right look or if Dubai is the right look for Boulder. But again, just starting to think what that would be like like and um, and know that the people back in the day they were dreaming about the future of Boulder and that uh, we need to do it now and that people in the future will do it as well. Um, that takes me to step five which is the idea again of thinking outside the box. Dance very helpful to help you think outside the box <laughs> and I was going with this metaphor of thinking outside the box and I thought you know what maybe there's a problem with thinking outside the box if the box is the same old, same old box. So here I'm kind of experimenting with a variety of different boxes because again I'm thinking that if we really want to in imagine the yet unimagined, we not only need to think outside the box, we need to actually think outside a different box. And so here, I'm just around the neighborhood trying to think deeply and profoundly outside the box. And again, the diversity of the boxes, trying to represent some of the diverse needs and realities and um, possible pleasures here in Boulder. And again, this is not what I'm saying should be, but it kind of, <laughs> how shall I say, it kind of suggests that unless you do get involved, that my ideas are gonna be the ones on the table. And I don't know how you feel about this like <laughs> beverage looking architecture, but it's cool because they're all connected with straws. That's great. But again, it's super important for everybody's voice to be at the table. I hope if you're in the mood, you'll consider contributing to this, this effort. Thanks. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we did not only have videos, so we would have her in person with a video background where performing in farmer's markets, outdoor gatherings, and it was so effective. It, we increased incredibly 
the participation. So that led to a vote that went into um, uh, raising, uh, I think it was like $8 million to first uh, uh, build a park. But again, the lime green sketches really <laughs> uh, work really well. And this was the plan that was approved. And then they did a first phase, uh, uh, $8 million to actually uh, build a park. The first phase is uh, completed. They're already starting the second phase. Uh, and it was an incredible uh, transformation in that, in that engagement. And then, uh, do we have about three, 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 four minutes? I have one more video, but if it's, it takes about four minutes. Okay, so this one is, so at the end of my six year there, this is kind of a, an ad hoc, I mean, a, an improv. So there was an interview about the park at my last interview with the local uh, channel. And I wanted to bring up some of the absurdities as well around uh, historic landmarking, but you would see uh, how it turned out. In June of 2015, City Council accepted the updated Boulder Civic Area Master Plan, which defines the overall concept for the Civic Area Park and establishes criteria and guidelines for the consideration of specific improvements. The site includes the area between Canyon Boulevard and Arapahoe Avenue, and between 9th and 14th Streets. The long-term vision is to transform the Civic Area into a unique and active destination that reflects the community's shared values, providing spaces and programs for people to gather, recreate, learn, and innovate. Joining us for an update on the civic area are city planner Sam Asafa and project coordinator Joanna Crean. Welcome to Inside Boulder. Thank you. And Joanna, I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit of background on how the $8.7 million phase one project's going. This yes, absolutely. Part. So we have done a lot of work with the community and engaged in the design of the park. Um, we had a number of options that were being considered that has been narrowed down to one. That one option is being brought through the city's process in terms of planning, development, design, review. And we're actually at a point where we plan to start construction um, by the end of the summer and Labor Day. Okay. And, and Sam, I know part of this visioning and design phase for the civic area was to really think about new concepts to gather people. Yes. And one of the things we keep hearing about is the band shell. I'm just wondering where that's at. So the band shell is one of the most important elements in the civic area, and there's been a lot of discussion, community conversation about that. So what we've done is have heard from thousands of people about ideas. We've engaged professionals to actually help us figure out how best to re relocate the band shell within the civic area. And the idea that really um, uh, had the most support currently is one that would actually locate the band shell um, on top of the tea house. And it will be structured in a way that it's incredibly uh, proportioned so that they both respect, respect each other from a design perspective. And what is even more compelling is an idea that you take the atrium building and uh, that could be on top of the band shell. Yeah. And it's a really phenomenal idea that was actually brought by an architect from um, the Netherlands, Ram Koolhaas. <laughs> and it's well structured in which you have a balanced historic structures. The only, uh, within, you know, one on top of the other, the atrium building is a pyramidal shape. So that would be the top of that. This was a complete improv. Elements. The pictures are done And afterwards. one challenge we had was uh, it will be, um, it, it, it won't meet our height ordinance. So it will become, it will have to go <laughs> above 55 foot height. But we're very encouraged that <laughs> City Council <laughs> just recently at our last meeting, <laughs> meeting um, actually um, wanted to actually put on the charter an amendment to the height limits so that this project could actually, actually be implemented. So we're very excited and uh, <laughs> there's a lot of public support for, for the idea, and I think people would really appreciate the architectural importance of um, the, this kind of historic uh, preservation. Well, and stackable design really is taking the Netherlands by storm, so stackable it makes sense that we would bring it to Boulder. I do have one other question, though. I understand that we've been modifying mm -hmm. parking you know, in the civic area, yes, but yes. a lot of things have been landmarked, yes. and there's been a movement to landmark every third parking space as historic. <laughs> How will we relocate yeah. that? Is that going to be part of the new hospital complex? That's going to be a challenge, especially when you're landmarking every third. And if it was every other one, that would actually 
be better. And it's, it, it'll take a long time to explain why that is the case. <laughs> so <laughs> what we decided to do is actually look at the Boulder Community Health site and see if we can mitigate that uh, situation. But we can still landmark every third parking spot <laughs> and then be able to actually accommodate some of them. Um, we may have to share one parking space uh, through three cars. So this idea of stackable design could come into play there as well. What we like learned- Like many parking garages. Exactly, so what we learned from the band shell, tea house, and atrium stocked up, the structural uh, uh, innovation from that, we wanna apply to stacking cars and one parking <laughs> space could be shared by three people. So if you're landmarking every third parking spot, then you can offset it by stacking up three cars in one parking spot. So that's another innovation that we're really excited about. I think the Civic Area is going to be a destination spot for so many reasons. So thank yes. you both for joining us today and giving us an update on where that project is. Thank, thank you, you for having us here. <laughs> So that was complete improv, then went back and put the Photoshop, and he went with it, so Photoshop those things, and then that was added later. So anyways, so that, you know, you have to have some uh, <laughs> levity in some of our conversations that we have, especially about landmarking. So thank you for indulging me.